Good morning, everyone. Um, so welcome to the second class for law and literature. Um, I wanted to start by going over some of the methods that we looked at last class and then make some comments about the reading and discussion that you've been engaging with um, and then move into some wider comments about um, the forms of response to uh, historical trauma because we're starting, we're starting to look at that with um, this example of the tall man um, and also of course um, individual trauma in context. So last week, last time we met, I was looking at some of the methods that we draw on in law and literature. So it, it helps to go back to these methods and I would encourage you to do this also when you're thinking about the research topics for your essay or even in your online posts when you um, just think not only about the questions and the subject matter that we're dealing with but how you're responding to that subject matter and so the question of you know why law and literature and how is that relevant here um, so essentially when we look at these methods we're really looking at different questions of form so um, especially when we start to look at um, slavery next week and then the Holocaust, um, one of the big questions, and this really comes from the 20th century, is how should we respond to the, the kinds of limit events or the, the kinds of huge traumatic events that don't easily fit into um, already established forms of law. So if you think about um, the kinds of cases that you've dealt with in tort law or in criminal law, um, through the practice of precedent, there, there are patterns that you can see. So, you know, we have categories of, say, murder, or we have categories of assault in, um, in criminal law and in tort law, um, the different torts of, say, a battery or, again, of assault or negligence is obviously the big one there. So these forms of law are designed to respond to, in a way, the most common kinds of injuries that we see. So in criminal law, we're dealing with um, deliberate injury. In tort law, we're dealing usually with, with some kind of accidental injury. Um, and what we see in the 20th century, not only in law, but also in other disciplines such as history or in literature, are people thinking about what to do when there are acts of violence that go outside what we expect or go outside um, the sorts of um, injuries and actions that law up to that point or society up to that point were used to dealing with. So that's why we always see, well, we tend to see the Holocaust being referred to as this limit event. And what I mean by limit event is that it, it comes to the limit of understanding. And so I was talking about trauma studies in our first class and the idea of trauma, if you remember, is that it's an experience that exceeds our frameworks of understanding. So um, you, know, you might walk along the footpath and trip over and you get a shock. You might even be injured, but generally that wouldn't be described as a, a trauma. Whereas if, you got, uh, if you're walking along the footpath and you got you know, hit by a car, that would be traumatic because it's outside your um, usual expectation of what's going to happen. Um, and if you think about events such as the Holocaust or processes such as slavery or the Stolen Generations, um, they are dealing with trauma on a mass scale. So you're not even dealing with individual perpetrators and victims, you're dealing with large groups. Um, and so not only law but also culture come up against this problem of how do you respond? How do you have a legal process that's adequate to meet that sort of violence? Um, and even culturally, how do you tell the story of what happened? How do you narrate it? How do you um, come to terms with that? Um, in the later 20th century and the 20th, 21st century, we see different forms of transitional justice. So, for example, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, which dealt with the harms of apartheid. Um, there are different kinds of responses that come through international rights frameworks, so um, say the genocide provisions um, that allow responses to say the Rwandan genocide, um, and if we think of Australia, then 
the Harry Ox report and inquiry into the stolen generations in the 90s would also be an example. So try the, these processes take from legal uh, forms, but they're something else, they're something extra. So they're not just criminal law or tort law or all, all those processes that you used to do. They do it on a large scale um, and um, are extending beyond what the law has previously done. So there's this idea, I suppose... And some people would say that it's already somewhat of a literary process when the law does that because the law is using metaphors um, beyond its established processes. So if we think of um, the stolen generations, then the Heriock Report uses the forms of testimony and inquiry, um, but it relaxed the rules of evidence um, in order to accommodate people's trauma and also in order to get the stories from people that wouldn't have been able to be told if, say, they were subject to cross-examination in that way because of the passage of time, because of language difficulties, because of the absence of documentation. And we'll go into more detail about that um, later in the subject. So if we look at the methods that we have examined, um, the first I talked about was law and literature, um, using literature as a supplement to legal process. And if you remember, I referred to Y.T. Dimmock's book, Residues of Justice, which is on your bibliography. So the central idea here is that the justice produced by legal processes is incomplete, and that becomes supplemented by imaginative projects, which are usually, in this example, literary. But, you know, of course, you can use films or poems or, or any um, imaginative response. So, again, the idea is that the law is about, according to Dimmick, a kind of quantification, um, and the law can't capture everything. And, and I suppose that another way to think about this is that the law should not capture everything. So if you think about even run-of-the-mill um, criminal cases or tort cases, um, because we're applying precedent and principles, we're not going to capture everything about the particularity of someone's experience. So if we're talking even about a car accident, um, everything that makes that person unique and even the car accident unique, he's not going to be um, caught by the legal process. So what Dimmick would say is that literature comes in as a supplement at this point. And so law itself doesn't give us justice, but law plus some kind of social or imaginative act does. So, and that could even be you know, the telling of stories around an accident, um, the, the way in which people just tend to tell you know, uh, family and friends at a small level what has happened to them. Um, that becomes part of family law or the, um, the stories of a friendship group. Um, and then we can think of it more widely, the sorts of films or stories that are told. Um, if you think of a popular example would be... Um, um, all the, the sorts of legal drama um, films that we have and even the, the kinds of um, you know, CSI investigative um, shows around criminal justice. So one, one way of thinking about those shows is that, uh, yes, we have criminal law dealing with, say, the really terrible traumatic stuff of say murder and rape and, and different kinds of sexual violence and then you have popular shows like CSI kind of coming in and um, I suppose filling out the cultural impact of those stories and um, of the effects of those sorts of crimes on society and on families and friend and friendship groups um, so the law you know has a certain limited value in in this way of thinking about Things. So it's an important function, but it's not the only thing um, that's necessary in order to achieve justice. Um, we also looked at narrative forms of law. So, um, the and this comes. Um, well, I drew attention to um, the Binder and Weisberg book, Literary Criticisms of Law, which which I indicated as a, a very useful book in thinking through these different kinds of methodologies um, but basically this sort of says you know both law and literature tell stories so you think of law as narrative in this approach and this was one of the earlier approaches um, to law and literature uh, so it definitely has a place I would say the law as supplement approach is probably more useful 
um, in what we're looking at in this subject. So if you think about the Helen Garner book, I mean, definitely she's making the case that, um, well, in some ways she'd be making the argument that not only is her book a supplement to law, but that it uh, it surpasses law in some ways in, in its view of justice, that law is just a technicality and that, that you know, she's the one who's um, really uh, giving us a full picture of this case. Um, and I think that the tall man is similar as well in terms of its view of law as, uh, I'm sorry, as literature as supplement. So um, what what this book is really trying to do is explain the gaps that you know that just aren't visible when you read the accounts um, of say the coroner's reports. Um, and then the various appeals, you don't get the historical context, you don't get um, the context of police culture and the politics, the very specific politics of Queensland um, and how that has influenced um, the, the carriage of the case. Um, and then I explained that the third methodology, formal questions of inquiry, has become um, more popular. So in the last sort of 10 years, um, we're looking at questions of, say, genre, so thinking about, you know, you know, transitional justice as a melodrama is one of the examples that I brought up, and, and I'll say much more about that as we go into transitional justice questions later in the course. Um, and then modern studies, which are related to that, so I don't really want to talk about that now because um, much more relevant to what we're doing at the moment is the um, literature supplement um, approach. So one of the, the questions, of course, is what is Chloe Hooper's project in writing this book? So why did she write this book and, and why did she take the approach that she did? Um, and there are different ways of thinking this through. So one question, of course, is um, I suppose that the contrast between what the legal process is undertaking and what Chloe Hooper undertakes in this book. Um, and one important question, and, and this has probably been posed to you in different forms, say from your foundations course or different um, electives throughout your law degree, is the question of formal equality and formal processes in the law and the relation of those formal pro processes to um, issues of race or gender or material inequality. So what that contrast is getting at is um, what, in some ways, what kind of reality does law represent? So there are different ways to get at that critique or think through that critique, um, but at a, you know, a, a quite simple level, it's just getting at the contrast between how law represents, um, say, questions of um, intention or cause or um, context or how it does not address those questions um, and what might be going on in terms of the historical context of a community um, or even into the present. So what we have with um, Hooper's book is this really quite nuanced investigation and description of Palm Island, um, particularly looking at violence. So this is, The Tall Man's obviously um, a story about violence, um, and one of the important arguments that the book makes is that this act of violence has to be seen in the context of the extreme violence um, of this community and also in the context of historical violence. So. Hooper frames um, the history, so the, the colonialism itself, um, as a violent process. And in particular, she's referring to um, the habits of protectionism and paternalism, so the ways in which Indigenous people um, were physically controlled, so, so made to live in certain areas. Um, their, their movement was controlled, their ability to work and be paid and so on. Um, and also it's important in the context of the stolen generations. So 
Hooper's argument in this book is that you can't understand um, either the present day violence or the particular violence, the case that um, she's looking at with respect to Hurley, um, unless you look at this wider pattern of both contemporary and historical violence. Um, so, and that's where we get the the quotes um, of, of again this contrast between formal equality and even though the law doesn't use the term reconciliation, the political corollary would be reconciliation, where um, which entails you know that, that all injustice has gone on in the past um, and has now ended, um, especially following the apology, and, and that now we we move on as equals. Um, and so what Hooper is getting at is that there's an invisibility around this history. So, for example, she quotes Detective Sergeant Darren Robinson, who says that you know it's sort of unbelievable that um, people, uh, quote, are going into this stolen generation thing, you know, and he says, I'm just in effing disbelief that they're bringing up that shit at this time, end quote, and... That's on page 64 of the book. So, um, and I think, that, you know, even though it's quite a violent way of saying it, um, Hooper's argument here is that this is what many Australians think you know, with respect to um, the stolen generations, that, you know, everyone's equal in law now, um, the stolen, stolen generations were long ago, you know, how is this relevant? Um, and so the particular details of the history of um, protectionism on Palm Island and also the stolen generations and how they affect present day um, are, are extremely effective in this book um, and become part of the, the argument. And it's, I mean, the, the genre that Hooper is writing in is, um, I, I suppose, a kind of creative nonfiction in the sense that it, it's not um, a political treatise or history per se. I mean, she obviously places herself in the narrative, um, but if we contrast it to Helen Garner, she places herself in the narrative in a very different way um, compared to um, Helen Garner. Um, but but you know, basically we have Hooper describing uh, many scenes of violence, um, domestic violence, so, so to set the scene of um, Hurley's assault. Um, you know, it's given to us that, that this is in the, the context of Hurley addressing um, an incident of domestic violence, um, and you know, she Hooper goes around and, and visits um, some of the, the women and witnesses, and um, it, you know, it, it's clear that it, it's an extremely violent society. She cites murder rates on the island, um, and gives us the context of the sort of, uh, in many ways, tough job that Hurley would have had policing in that community. Um, so, you know, she's not completely unsympathetic to Hurley, um, which is also, um, I think, an interesting question in itself. Um, so if we think about um, Chloe Hooper's overall project, then it definitely is about this supplement to law. So looking at the failures of the case, so I think what, what most people would see as, um, as a failure, and then thinking about why that failure has taken place. So rather than coming down with an opinion, say, that um, that just looks at morality or wickedness, so one way to think about Hurley would just be framing what he has done as immoral or um, if you've done Penny Croft's class and, and looked at questions of uh, wicked culpability than, than some sort of form of individual culpability in that, that sense. And that framework would also um, capture some of the excesses of law. So um, in other words, the, the sorts of questions that Penny asks are, um, you know, well, for a start, why doesn't the law look at questions of good, of good and evil? So when did the law let go of that framework? Because that framework did exist in the past. Um, and what is not captured um, by the refusal of law uh, to use that framework. So one way it would be to come in and just think about Hurley um, as doing something um, unconscionable or wicked and, um, and framing the event in that way. Um, and as you can see from the book, Chloe Hooper has not 
taken that approach. So in, in some moments he's quite compassionate um, towards Hurley, so really looking at, um, I suppose, this question of him snapping or breaking. So you have those sorts of metaphors that um, she explores the evidence that um, he was well-liked in the Aboriginal community, that he seemed to behave in a way that was supportive of the community, um, uh, particularly of the children, um, and that there's some way in which perhaps um, you know, he could no longer cope or he had some sort of breakdown. So that that's one, I mean, she doesn't sort of belabor that point, but um, it's definitely not a tale of wickedness. There's, there's some compassion for where he's coming from, um, at least at the point of violence, perhaps not so much subsequently in the way that he's dealt with um, illegal proceedings and the questions of his own responsibility. Um, but what Chloe Hooper has done instead of using that framework of morality or wickedness is take a step back and put Hurley in a wider context. So instead of just thinking of questions of individual behaviour, um, and if we think about what the law does in um, say criminal law or in tort law, you're looking very much at um, a person's um, very specific actions within limited time frames. So um, in criminal law, especially in sentencing, um, questions of the past might be relevant. So questions even of, say, um, childhood, um, any difficulties, mental illnesses, um, upbringing, those sorts of questions. Um, but we're still within the framework of the individual. And the law in those contexts doesn't address history. So we don't have... Um, you know, the substantial reference to, say, the Stolen Generations or to a history of colonialism um, in any of the legal proceedings that um, deal with Hurley's actions. Um, so, again, in that way, what Hooper is doing is using her work and her argument to supplement the law. And, and she doesn't explicitly say this, but the implicit argument would be the law has not provided justice. Um, what we need for justice is... Uh, well, some sort of new legal proceeding in these very specific circumstances, but also what we need is to understand the wider historical context and the wider political context, um, which includes colonialism, which includes the Solon generations, and why Palm Island has been, uh, you know, has become such a, a violent place, and also the history of the Queensland Police Force and that institution. If you think about um, the history of corruption in different state police forces in Australia um, and also the history of entrenched racism, particularly in Queensland. So these institutions have their own life um, and these questions um, are of great relevance to um, Hurley's actions. Um, and you know, we, we especially see this, I suppose, in, in what followed his actions and the cover-up and the different legal processes um, that ensued. And interestingly, in the book, um, Hooper does refer to different quasi-judicial processes um, that, that are relevant. So, for example, the Royal Commission um, that ran in the late, uh, late 80s, um, also known as the Fitzgerald Inquiry, that looked at the Queensland Police Force and made findings of um, quite significant corruption. So basically the idea was that well, the findings were that, that the police force in Queensland um, was, had a culture of corruption, um, a, a culture of solidarity, um, which meant that police officers backed each other up. Um, and um, obviously this led to um, instances of gross injustice. Um, and ultimately that inquiry, the Fitzgerald inquiry, brought down the government at the time, um, Joe Bielke-Peterson, um, who was quite a, a character at the time, um, the Premier of, of Queensland, um, and the jailing of the then police commissioner. So we have reference to that particular Royal Commission. Um, and also, um, perhaps more importantly, the early 90s Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, um, which was... Um, an extremely important investigation um, into the pervasiveness of Aboriginal deaths in custody and what could be done um, 
in terms of um, uh, legal responses and policy responses and cultural responses to that. Um, so the reason I bring um, this up is that the Royal Commission form itself is an interesting form. So um, I was talking earlier about transitional justice processes and we will get to that um, when we start looking at the Stolen Generations and the Holocaust in more detail. Um, but the Royal Commission form is, I mean, it's, it's not a transitional justice process, but it is quasi-judicial. So it's a creature of statute, so it's... Um, a form of inquiry that has quite specific and quite large powers um, under statute. Um, and we can think here of, in this regard, the Royal Commission going beyond um, what the usual legal forms can do, so sort of branching out to fit the um, particular purpose. And the Royal Commission form has been quite popular in Australia and New Zealand. It's, it's, a, it's a form that you see in all the Commonwealth countries, but um, Australia in particular seems to have had a number um, of commissions since Federation 1901. Um, so what is a Royal Commission? It's basically a non-court-based tribunal. So it's some of the advantages are that it's not bound by the usual rules of evidence of courts and um, significantly it can also they can adopt an inquisitorial approach so it's a very good way of um, has great powers in compelling witnesses to give evidence um, and then you know if you think of the complex rules of evidence that we have in the um, common law courts um, and, and obviously there are good reasons for that um, but in terms of getting information or getting evidence about um, a wider problem, so going beyond questions of individual guilt and responsibility, you need different kinds of evidence. And so the Royal Commission um, can a Royal Commission can be formed under the Royal Commissions Act, which is the Commonwealth Act um, in 1902, um, to generate these powers of. Um, of obtaining evidence, um, compelling witnesses to give evidence, um, and thereby, um, I guess, getting to the bottom of a social problem such as deaths in custody, or if you think about the contemporary Royal Commission into institutional responses to child abuse. So they, they're generally formed around important um, social and political questions. Um, and the idea is that... Um, the Commission will have powers to make recommendations, but again, they're just recommendations, so you're also relying on the politicians of the day to implement those recommendations. So, as I said, it's, it's, the Commission form is not subject to, say, Commonwealth legislation regarding evidence. Um, it operates with its own regime of evidence rules. Um, and what you usually see is that the terms of reference that um, become part of the act that establishes um, the, um, the the particular commission. Um, it will, they will usually those terms of references will usually go beyond questions regarding individual victims and perpetrators. Usually, we're looking at um, responsibility of institutions or um, of you know, groups of people, um, including say governments and their agencies, or it might be the legal profession, the police, etc. So Hooper, one of the contexts that Chloe Hooper is examining is the relationship between um, police and community, um, which is one of the questions that the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody examined. Um, and as Hooper points out, um, the death of Malwinji was the 147th um, since the introduction of the Royal Commission. Um, and both the Royal Commission and Hooper's book are obviously interested in the effectiveness of the law to protect Indigenous people. And um, obviously um, both processes put a big question mark over the ability of law. So getting back to that question of formal equality under the law, obviously um, Aboriginal people are treated equally um, under the law. Um, as as non-Aboriginal people, but the police culture with respect to Aboriginal people is sometimes very different, um, and particularly in the 
the instance of, of Palm Island. So the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody um, had the purpose of looking at not only how people died but why they died. So um, essentially the question was, you know, why do Aboriginal people who at that time formed about 1.5% of the Australian population have 20 times the risk of dying in police custody and 10 times the risk of dying in prisons. So why were so many more Aboriginal people put in cells in prison in the first place compared to non-Aboriginal people? Um, were Aboriginal people being treated fairly by the law? Um, and then even wider questions of why are so many Aboriginal people unemployed, poorly housed, poorly educated? Why is their health, health poor? Why is their life expectancy shorter than other Australians? So you can see by the questions that were outlined in the report of the Royal Commission that, that these are a broad social and political questions. These are not the sorts of questions that can be addressed through legal cases. So the form of the Royal Commission provides a venue for different and wider questions to be answered. So this, was, this inquiry was set up at a time when Indigenous um, police relations were um, at one of their, their kind of worst moments. So there were the, the high rate of new deaths in custody. Um, there was a very, very low rate of regulatory authorities finding police responsible for this high rate of Aboriginal deaths. Um, and there was increasing public protests, so national rallies and protests calling for this um, accountability. And this is particularly in the late 80s, so 1989, you start to get these um, protests. So the Royal Commission at that time was conscious of this public animosity and distrust. Um, and what it wanted to do was thoroughly investigate each death. So each Aboriginal death in custody um, was going to be investigated and that included looking at documentation, interviewing people, um, asking questions about, say, police culture, about practices of um, arrest, practices of incarceration and, and getting at why these deaths were occurring. So... The idea was, and, and the suspicion was obviously that there was a lot of foul play on the part of police um, and the Royal Commission's goal was to find evidence of this if, if that were the case. So the Royal Commission investigated 99 deaths and this investigation was executed in a quasi-judicial manner. So that meant that there were formal public hearings um, and the examination of files, um, so, so most of these would have been state files and police files, um, but the Royal Commission also acknowledged the limitations of those files because necessarily if, if you're dealing with a problematic or corrupt institution, then you're generally not going to find incriminating, incriminating evidence on files. Um, and the report that the Royal Commission published at the end of its process said, um, quote, not infrequently the files contained false or misleading information. All too often the files disclosed not really the, not really the recorded life history of the Aboriginal person, but also the prejudices, ignorance and paternalism of those making the record. So that was um, in the National, the National Report, um, volume one, pages four to five. So in other words... There's a, a, cultural, a, a culture of racism and you could also probably say continuing colonisation, so the sense of um, paternalism or a continuing idea that Aboriginal people in Australia have a certain place. Um, Commissioner Wooten, who was heading the Royal Commission, said, um, quote, often official records and reports tell more about the person who wrote them and that person's attitude to the Aboriginal subject than they do about the Aboriginal. Um, and that was written in the Regional Report of Inquiry, Inquiry into New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania, um, page 12. So 
The Royal Commission looked at documents. They also conducted interviews with and received submissions from family members of victims, um, governments, government agencies, Indigenous organisations and also community members. Um, there were public hearings of, of every death, so each of those 99 deaths, um, and these were held usually in the hometown of the deceased, um, the town in which the death occurred, or in the capital city. So what they also did, and, and you find this in Royal Commissions or, or other quasi-judicial um, processes, is that there was some attention paid to the venue for hearing um, these this, this evidence. So they tried to avoid using local courtrooms, um, especially in the rural or regional towns, because um, Indigenous people usually have negative connotations for those places, um, you know, in part because of the death in custody and the structural racism that has um, informed the relationship between non-Indigenous and Indigenous people. Um, and so what they did also before these hearings was tried to liaise. So they, they had Indigenous field officers and num, uh, a number of lawyers who would visit the local Indigenous community to explain the process of the hearings um, and explain what the Royal Commission was doing. So, um, so if I just step away from the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody at the moment, um, if you're interested, it might be worth looking at the current Royal Commission. So um, I'll just give you that website. So I think it's important, I mean, it's interesting to compare it most specifically to the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, but I think also it's interesting and important for you as law students and, and lawyers to look at what this contemporary quasi-judicial process might look at look like. So the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custodies was in the early 90s, so quite a while ago now. If you look into the Royal Commission um, into Institutional Responses to Child Sex Abuse, and the website for that is childabuseroyalcommission.gov.au, um, it, it's really quite extraordinary what... The, this current commission is doing um, with its terms of reference. So there, um, I think there, there are still hearings, still public hearings. So when there are public hearings, they're um, submitted over the internet, so you can watch them live wherever you are in Australia. Um, they're not recorded, so you can't subsequently watch those recordings, but you can have access to the transcript of all the proceedings. Um, and so, as you know, if you've done any court work, you know, it, it's extremely difficult usually to get transcripts. So either, you, unless you're a party or have an interest, you usually don't have a, a right to get those transcripts. And even if you can, um, they're very expensive um, to obtain. So the um, it, it's quite extraordinary that, that all that evidence is available on the website. So you can either look at the hearings as they appear, or you can go and look at um, the the transcripts of the hearings, um, and also all the evidence that is submitted um, is also available online. and And then subsequently, the um, the reports of the Royal Commission for each of the case studies is also published online. So it, it gives you. I mean, there's so much material there, but it, it gives you a really good sense of how the Royal Commission works, um, how wide its powers are, and in many ways how good it is at looking at wider questions that the law, um, you know, by law I mean you know, cases um, and, and legislation can't usually deal with. So usually we're not looking at those those wider historical and um, political social questions. So going back to the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, um, the, I mean this it's not the same as the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Abuse, um, but the similarity is that it, it did have these wide powers and the Royal Commission was making a very earnest attempt to look at um, a wide range of causes. So um, not only was it looking at those 99 cases, 
you also had sociologists and criminologists looking at um, the standard of living of Aboriginal communities, um, questions around health, um, poverty, employment, so um, that, that also are obviously going to impact on um, the life expectancy and, and health of Aboriginal citizens. So a number of research units were set up to answer these questions. Um, so in summary, the Royal Commission concluded that the deaths, so the 99 case studies that they examined, were not the result of any system defect per se. And also what was, I suppose, more disappointing for people was that there, were, there was not one single successful prosecution of a police officer or a prison officer arising from that inquiry. Um, and only two commissioners, Wooten and Wyville, um, made strong recommendations that the conduct of certain police officers should be further investigation, investigated by disciplinary and prosecutorial authorities. So, in other words, the, no case of individual responsibility um, um, arose out of um, this quite detailed um, process. Um, what did happen was that there was a, a national report published. This was it's quite enormous, it's five volumes, you can access it online. Um, it was tabled in April 1991 and it made 339 recommendations regarding the underlying issues surrounding the deaths. Um, and one of the commissioners has said that although this report is a document that most people refer to when looking at what the Royal Commission did, he says, from our point of view, that was almost an accidental tack on the real job, end quote. Um, the predominant finding was that ind Indigenous people were vastly overrepresented in custody and the Royal Commission concluded that it was because of this overrepresentation of ind Indigenous people that so many deaths had occurred. Um, so the recommendations, the 339 recommendations made by this Royal Commission focus primarily on the adequacy of police and subsequent co coronial investigations into the deaths in custody. Um, they also addressed questions of self-determination and empowerment of Aboriginal communities, um, social, educational, vocational, legal services, um, questions of cultural diversity, um, questions of alcohol and substance abuse, um, the need to improve police relations with and the treatment of Indigenous people, improving custodial care, um, and also they refer to our international obligations as in Australia um, with respect to these issues. Um, and then the wider questions of land and the continued political importance of recognising Aboriginal people. So you, you can just sort of see from those recommendations how broad they are. Um, and in some ways, I think uh, many people were disappointed. So we don't have statements of individual responsibility, for example. Um, you know, th there's very little said about the um, responsibility, say, arising from po particular police cultures. Um, it, you, there's much more of a, a kind of vague finding that Indigenous people are overrepresented in the custodial system, and, th and this is why... Um, there are too many deaths in custody. Um, but there were also some very specific recommendations that were helpful um, that dealt with you know, the, the practices in arresting Indigenous people and imprisoning them and um, so the use of um, security cameras and um, cultural consultation and, and those kinds of findings. Um, But yeah, so so essentially, one way of positioning um, what happened to Cameron Dumaji is that not much has changed, or not enough has changed since this Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. So um, you know, even though there was this significant investigation and, and we had these recommendations, that still there are very bad relations between police and Indigenous people um, in some parts of Australia. So you know. One question is, you know, how specific is this? Is this a Palm Island problem? How much of it is a Palm Island problem? How much of it is an Australian problem? How um, useful is it to think of it at the national level um, when we're looking at specific local histories?
So, you know, one question is, we've had this extensive inquiry. I mean, you know, it is about 25 years ago, but why have these problems persisted um, following this inquiry? Um, so there are a few things to be said here. So some scholars have looked at the fact that although there are you know, this great number of recommendations, 339 recommendations, um, the fact is that the various federal, state and territory governments did not fully implement those recommendations. So the, th you know, the, the great advantage of a Royal Commission form is that it has these amazing powers to collect evidence and to compel witnesses to give evidence. But on the other hand, it can't compel governments to implement its recommendations. So it's only as good as... Um, as the government's ability and willingness to implement those recommendations. So some jurisdictions, so New South Wales, for example, has implemented um, a greater number of those recommendations than a jurisdiction such as Queensland. And so there's some evidence that there is... Um, that, that, you know, that Aboriginal deaths in custody are less likely to happen in New South Wales and... Um, I dealt with um, in a much more transparent way than jurisdictions such as um, Queensland. Um, but other people say, look, there, there were still problems with the Royal Commission. So basically, even though it did have uh, freedom with and um, some powers, um, it was limited in other ways, which meant that um, it, you know, even though it had this great remit or you know these, these great ideals um, it wasn't empowered to actually achieve those reforms so one criticism um, addresses the form of royal commissions more widely and says you know because royal commissions have um, roles in both fact finding and advising and that's the same case with the current royal commission into child abuse um, you know, perhaps it's these royal commissions have too much to do, um, and for example, the you know the collection management and dissemination of you know just enormous amounts of information can inhibit um, the time and resources that the commission can be put into questions, say, of policy advising. I think the other um, role that the Royal, that Royal Commissions have, of course, is to make particular issues relevant and um, prominent in the public imaginary. So if you think about the, the current Royal Commission into child abuse, child abuse has, has become very much um, a, a topical issue. And so the, the kinds of questions that the Royal Commission is addressing um, becomes part of the, the public vernacular and, and that's of course um, useful in, in uh, political and social change and it was the same with the Royal Commission to Aboriginal Deaths in Custody so it did uh, bring to mind this question at the time um, and make it a political issue. Um, I, I mean the, the downside to that of course is once the Commission's over the um, yeah, um, 